Them. Okay, then we're in. Wicked. LaJoyce Brookshire, Dr. LaJoyce Brookshire. Let me let me put the respect on the name and, and give you the proper titles. Um, what an honor to sit and chat with you because I have been diving into this book and um it's a book that I didn't know that I needed. You know, I I I I I was put onto you by Mobo from Pitch. Um and um shout out to Lani as well, who's working on the project with you, and they sent me a copy. And I started reading it on the train and I was like, you know, this is everything that I need to be learning about and knowing about as not just a, a woman uh, that's a broadcaster, but a, a label owner as well. And somebody within within the industry trying to create change. Um, so yes. we're going to get into the book. But firstly, how are you? I am well, thank you. I am so happy to be with you, Jams. I think that you are supremely talented. Thank you. Let me just no. say that. Well, I think it's women like yourself that have gone through the doors and, and held them open and are still holding them open to this day. That's kind of allowed us next generation to come through. So my first question would be um, for you, you know, wanting to work in the music industry. Was there another woman that was maybe a generation ahead of you that you could look to that inspired you? Oh, absolutely. I grew up in Chicago where radio is supreme. And I actually was the girl who grew up with the radio. I did not watch much television growing up, a show here or there, you know, Batman was my dude. But mm -hmm. other than that, I was really hooked on radio. And I had to stay up until a certain time every night to hear one of the famous DJ sign off and then I could go to bed. I remember asking my mother for that radio. In fact, I talked so much in classes and amongst my friends, my nickname was radio. Wow. And there were, there were so many women who were doing the news and I was just enamored with the entire thing. I wanted to report the news because I always felt I needed to tell somebody something. So I felt the best way that I can do that is to be a news reporter. So that was my first aspiration. And there were lots of women who actually took my hand and said, this is how you do it. No, don't do this. No, please do that. And it went a long way for me. Being a mentor, mm -hmm. uh, having a mentor and being a mentee is invaluable. Yes, it really is. And I think seeing and believing, like I I have a sort of similar um, come up in terms of being in love with the radio, hearing so many women that I could earmark on the radio. And then when I got into the radio industry, there were so many women that were in senior positions on air, off air, uh, a lot of women of colour as well. I started off at a, a majority black station. But when I moved into the actual music industry side, and into the label uh, setting, that seemed to fall away and there was a lot less women and a lot less people of colour. So when you stepped into the doors of, of working in labels, w were there more women there or was, you, was, it, was, it, was it just you? No, it was never just me working at labels. There were lots of women, hence this book, Women Behind the Mic. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not forefront. We're not in the foreground. We quietly work behind the scenes. And I think that the quietness was good for a long time. And just being silent, moving in stealth mode like the syndicate. But it's not anymore. Mm -hmm. Now that I have a daughter who's college age, who's considering her own career, her friends, and it's not just enough to have plaques on your walls and pretty pictures and gold and platinum records. That's just not enough that we need to cement our legacy in history because history should be public. Yeah. And um, that is, mm -hmm. No, sorry, continue. Yeah. No, history should be public. And that is the point of the book, Women Behind the Mic, the movement. And so on the label scene, while it appears that it's all men. There are many women. However, it is a male dominated mm. industry. Yeah. Can you yes. tell me about your, your first break uh, into the, so, you know, obviously you had the radio side, the broadcasting career, but you also had a senior job, very senior job within labels and broke so many artists that we would know about as household names today. My first job on the label side, oh, 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 Polygram Records in the international a and department, by the way, yeah. where uh, the senior, the, the vice president, he was just amazing. And of course we had to get in early so that we could deal with overseas. And it was a riveting time. 
uh, to be at Polygram Records and those international artists that we handled at Polygram. But down the hall was Black Music Department. And I would look down there in envy. They just seemed to be having so much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see it. Like there's a party behind the glass, you know, and you guys are like that. Some- <laughs> but later I came to find out they used to look at me and say, oh, look at LaJoy, she's an international A&R. And I thought, what? But that was my first job. And then I went back to radio, to a syndicated radio network, which is American Urban Radio Network today. And then I went to Hush Productions with Melba Moore and Freddie Jackson. And uh, eventually I, and then I ended up at Arista. That's how I, and I ended up at Arista eventually, at Arista Records, where I was director of publicity, working with the fabulous Queen of Soul, Miss Aretha Franklin. There she is behind me. And all of those people behind me are probably pretty much Arista artists. But, you know, it comes a time when you gather so much gold and platinum, you don't have anywhere to put them. So that's all I have room for. <laughs> that's a good, problem. a good problem. It's a good problem to have. But we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, some incredible names, uh, Biggie to 112 to, you know, the list goes on. It's, it's a short sort of Google search to find out all the names of the artists that we really, the back catalogue is so strong. We listen to these artists today. They're being sampled. They're being referenced constantly. And you yes. were there and you were part of that story. Yeah. Um, did you find when you were in, let's say you use Arista, your time at Arista, did you find that you had to, um, as a woman, I guess, be louder in terms of getting your point across or um, direction? Like, what was the what was the temperature like for being a woman in, in, in those walls? Being a woman in the industry, I didn't find that I needed to be louder. I just found that I needed to be excellent. Mm. That was the most important thing was the excellence, that I couldn't be raggedy. I had to always be above par. I had to be a step ahead. And I don't know if you were raised like this, but we were raised that, you know, you have to, you have to be 100% better than everyone else. And that always stuck with me. And it turned out to be true. It wasn't a fallacy. And so in order for you to be recognized it had to be supreme, especially, and I'm going to correct you, it's not Arista, it's Arista. That was part of my job. Yeah, Arista. (laughs) Arista. My Brit is coming through, Arista. Yes. And, you know, we call it the the house that Clive Davis built. Mm -hmm. And so with Clive Davis being the stellar person that he is in industry wide, that everything had to be supreme. And then working with artists like Whitney Houston and Miss Aretha Franklin and Kenny G, Carly Simon, even that, it can't be lackluster. Yeah. So in order to have staying powder, power, for me, I found that it needed to be excellent first. So I didn't have to scream. I let my work speak for itself. And do you think that, because that's something that's been drummed into us from, you know, from an early age, especially uh, for minority, you know, communities and especially women and especially black women that's like the you don't even need to work 200 percent um you know as hard as the person next to you and you have a daughter you know who's college age do you feel like now you would enforce that kind of tradition that we've been told onto her or do you think it's do you think time should have changed that we don't have to be excellent we should be excellent for ourselves but do you you know I'm, i'm trying to say like sometimes it can be at our detriment i don't think it's ever to our detriment to be excellent mm. and i think that you can be you will be recognized for yeah. your excellence and yes that is something i have drilled into my daughter yeah. it's it, it comes with the package i do believe <laughs> yeah. i don't know i have no any other way how to do it that mm-hmm. and how to raise her to and i was just speaking to my husband the other day and telling him i said you know her worth work excellent her work ethic is amazing yeah. and that's yeah. because she saw us work yeah and i think it's important for your children to see you working Yes, definitely. And you have a, you know, you have a family, um, you're, you're a wife and, you know, you were able to forge this incredible career as well. So it's important for people to be able to see you have in both sides as well, because that is also, you know, do you think that for some women that may have come up at the same time as you or maybe women before you, that maybe when they did have a family that it was harder to advance in the industry? I I do think that it was harder to advance for a lot of women who had families at the time. And I will say this that a lot of my dear sisters sacrificed their personal lives for the industry. Mm. And it's not sad, 
but it, a lot of them have some regret now. A lot, a lot of them are happily single and happily child free, but overall, this industry snatched that from them because it is all hours, no clock. And when I really decided that it was time to have a family and really knuckle down and really, okay, have to do this, it was time for me to leave. And my husband and I wanted to have a start a family right away. And so, cause my clock was ticking. And so I, I said, well, we're going to do it. I hope this is not too much information, but this is true. I we wanted to do the rhythm method. So, you know, I'm peeing on the stick and seeing when I'm ovulating and it never failed. I was always ovulating clean across the country, out of the country. He was like, I cannot believe you're never here when this is happening. You get your butt back here. And it, uh, just some decisions had to be made. Yeah. So I, I tapped out of the entertainment industry for a very long time and retooled myself and be, that's how I became Dr. LaJoyce Brookshire right. and became a naturopathic doctor. I've always been an aficionado of wellness and staying well and helping people to stay healthy. So I went and got my doctorate degree, have two wellness centers, but I couldn't do this work at, as an entertainment person, a person working in the entertainment industry day to day, a mm. project here, a project there. Sure. I came out of retirement for some very wonderful things. And we call ourselves the village, we ladies. And whenever someone has a project, you know, one person takes one thing, one person takes another thing, because a lot of us tapped out to raise families. Yeah, yeah. And what could have been done more, do you think, at that time to, 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 to keep the women and retain the women that were doing this incredible work? <sighs> During that time, one of the things that could have been done to retain more women could have been working the position in, in swing and in like one person work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, one person work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, Wednesday being the day that you overlap job sharing. Job sharing, yeah. Could have yeah, been okay. that. And then, oh my gosh, if remote work would have been a thing, it would have been fantastic. But I could not remote work um, with artists like, Biggie, Puffy, and Miss Aretha. That wasn't going to work out. You know, I have to be at a photo shoot. I have to manage travel. I have to make sure that everything is set for a show. So that's, it's not really feasible in that regard. But, you know, the day to day and taking the phone calls, sitting at the desk work, that could have been done from home. And that yeah. would have been something to retain a lot of the women. Yeah, that's a really good shout, I think. And obviously, some of it is like technological advancements, but some of it is kind of just being a little bit, a little bit more kind of trustworthy of your of 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 the people that are working, you know, the bigger, the seniors, the VPs, the the, the vice presidents being considerate of the people that are working around them as well. Um, so what's been your biggest lesson whilst working in the music industry? My greatest lesson while working in the industry has been to have an understanding that it's show business and it's more business than show. Mm -hmm. And if the business part is not managed correctly, then the show part will completely fall apart. True story, not only for the past, but for today that still holds to be true. I just quit a project that their business structure is a disaster, a complete train wreck. And I was hired to write the bio. So I'm the writer on the team and they couldn't even get the instructions right on how to complete the bio. I had to throw it away three times and start over because every day they're telling me something different and something different and something different. And finally, when they tell me that, oh, this is wonderful, but the three things that we really need are not addressed. And I would have to interview the subject all over again. I literally have to start from scratch. And that would be for, I said, I can't work. I cannot do my best work under these conditions. I'm sorry. You're going to have to look for someone else. I don't have the time to do this. And yeah. I have, I have to cherish my time, my peace, my space, my mm. energy. And I'm, I'm grateful to be in a position to choose. Yeah. And that's because you you know your worth. Were there any women in hip hop, um, you know, maybe fellow uh, colleagues of yours or, or fellow women across the industry or even, you know, women uh, in front of the mic as well, the rappers that you felt really got their business down? They oh, had it to a yes. T. 
Oh, yes. Faith Evans. Yeah. Total. Queen Latifah. Monica. Deborah Cox. The women that we worked, that I worked with directly, we taught them. Mm -hmm. We taught them to be curious. We taught them about listening twice as much as you speak so that you can hear what people are saying. They will tell on themselves every time. And they learned the business, which is why all of those that I named are still prevalent today. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, still prevalent, still making money, still, you know, yes. but, yeah. <laughs> and look at how Queen Latifah has reinvented herself and reinvented herself and reinvent. It's almost as if she sits down and crosses her leg and says, I want to do a talk show and does a talk show. You know what? I like that equalizer. I'm going to be the equalizer. And I just love reinvention. Yeah. And I, I like to say I'm the mother of reinvention says. myself, but yeah, I just well. love the whole notion of being able to parlay what you've done to the next thing, to the next thing. And do you think that's the key to longevity and success? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I do think it is the key to longevity and so, and success to be able to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in these fast changing times. Absolutely. Do you remember some, you know, you've had, you've had like, you know, up, funk conversations with people that um, most people will never ever get the chance to some are no longer with us anymore but during your time at Arista um, do you remember any conversation that maybe really stuck with you that you had you know with with an artist oh my gosh I could name you a conversation with every artist that really stuck with me um, what can I share a lot is really personal Hmm. Um, and I'll tell you why, because when you are trapped and for lack of a better word, I'll use trapped, but when you are trapped at a photo shoot with an artist for 16 hours, it's you, they, the makeup people, the wardrobe people and the photographer, this is happening on a regular basis. You get to be pretty close with that person. And so there gets to be a level of intimacy that that transpires between the artist and the the handler or who, the manager, whoever is in the room setting it up, in my case, the publicist. So I would say that one thing that really stands out for me is Miss Aretha. She was so gracious. And that with her stature, as the level that she is as the queen, the queen of soul, but she always said, thank you. And didn't like, if someone was putting on her makeup and you handed her a glass of water, she'd look around the makeup person and go, thank you. And I always just saw that as maintaining a level of graciousness. So that's a lesson that I certainly took with me. And for Faith Evans in total, I lumped them together because we often did a lot of things together with uh, the, the two of them. And they taught me about getting rest. I, I'm a proponent of getting rest, but they would force the rest. So uh, they go, can we not do three in a row? Can we take a break in between? So what I started doing is I do maybe three interviews with them, take them to lunch, make sure they ate their vegetables. I was that doctor even then before I was doctoring, make sure they had good meals. And we'd get in a limo and I tell the driver, drive around for two hours and then put us in front of MTV at three o'clock. And they just like babies, they fall asleep because the car is moving and we get in a two hour nap. So, um, but they're the first artists that I started to realize I need to bill in rest time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, all those things that you're kind of talking about for me are kind of the qualities that uh, that a woman has, you know, essentially um, within the business side, but the qualities that a woman has. And I think about why I would like a woman as a manager or why I would like, you know, on my team there to be, you know, equal amounts of women and men, um, because there's certain aspects of things that I know will be taken care of in a different way. And that's what that's what's beautiful about having a team that's diverse you know um I want to talk about the book because you you know one thing is you didn't tell much of your own story in this book you've kind of handed no. the mic to everybody else so I'm sure there'll be uh, subsequent books that will will tell that story but the making of the book where did you start 
I'm writing that down, what you said, handing the mic to everyone else. Mm -hmm. Can I just back up for one second when you said uh, that's sort of a woman's role? It's nurturing. Mm -hmm. You have to nurture your artists. You cannot just treat them like a commodity. And that's what the women who worked behind the mic, that's what we did. We nurtured. And because at the end of the day, they need mothering, especially when they're young. They need yeah. mothering. And do you um, care? That's correct. And, and, and handling, very careful handling. Uh, the book came about Women Behind the Mic, Michelle Joyce, my dear sister, and I, we have been making good trouble for 25 plus years. <laughs> she worked at Bad Boy Records as director of marketing. She was their first director of marketing. And I was at Arista, so Bad Boy was a part of the Arista family. But Michelle and I had known each other for probably about five or six years prior to our Arista and Bad Boy days. And we were watching all of these biopics and documentaries unfold. And it just got to be to the point where we're saying something is really missing here. And it's the women. It is our sisters who we know did the work. In the New Edition biopic, for instance, for three days on the New Edition biopic, have you seen it, Johns? Yes, I have seen it. Yeah, and oh. I, yeah, I read the forward as well. So yeah, I, I was. Yes. I, now you say it, I was like, yeah, where were the women? Yes. So Renee Foster and Juanita Steffens, who was vice president of Black Music, who these women, when I talk about the nurturing, I mean, they made sure these boys got their studies, slept in good hotels, uh, had tutors, turned in their homework. They stayed on top of homework while these kids were on the road and even gave them condoms. Make sure they didn't get any trouble. And they were nowhere mentioned in the three days. And for me, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. Even though in the movie Notorious, where there's a scene where the publicist is depicted for the first time in the movie, and it's the scene where Faith is being interviewed and Biggie bangs on the door because he wants to talk about the Tupac mess. I stay silent. And <laughs> the man gets up. And when the man gets up, I'm in the movie theater and I freak out. But not only is it a man, it's a white man who's very clearly in the publicist role. And I stand up and freak out out in the movie. It was just, a. I went black. I blacked out and went crazy. We like to call it South Side of Chicago crazy. I went- You bought, bought Chi-Town. I went Chi-Town. <laughs> <laughs> and throwing popcorn, saying, I, oh, I'm a white man now? And so it was highly insulting. I felt erased. Mm -hmm. And the word is erasure. And as history is being rewritten, you know, revisionist history is in full swing. They want to take statues down. They want to rename things. And I call it all an educational moment. I don't think we should be doing any of that. That that's a moment to educate our children for what's not being taught. That's another story. So I, I, we got to work. And so Michelle and I started calling our sisters, told them to blow the dust off their memories. And we were going to write a book. We know how to write. We know how to put things together. We've planned tours for the greatest of all times. So we can plan a book tour as well. Oh. Yes. And it's a brilliant book. I mean, the stories in there and the learnings that you can find in there can be applied, you know, all the way to what's happening now, you know, different times in terms of the way that music's being consumed and put out. But there's some sort of key principles uh, that are in those stories and the passion and the uh, the ideas and kind of owning your position within it. You know, these women are being able to retell, tell their story and insert themselves back in where they where they may have been forgotten. So it's a really sort of powerful, yes. powerful place to be and to have this. So when you have you think about, you know, I don't know, like a young, a young music mogul that's coming through now and they pick up this book and they're a woman, what do you want them to take from the book? I want any young woman, including yourself, Jams, mm -hmm. to take away from this book that dreams are still worthwhile today. Grab hold of someone's hand. Do not be afraid to speak to people because, believe it or not, people in high-level positions, they'll speak back because they will remember when they were helped. And all of us pay it forward. There is a spirit in that book that reeks of I'm paying it forward. That is what we do now because that was done for us. Mm 
And so every single day we pay it forward, which is why we've written a curriculum to teach in high schools and on the collegiate level to teach about careers in the entertainment industry. And we provide pathways for them to have internships to actually work in the industry. So not be, do not be afraid. Yeah. Don't be afraid to dream. When I used to sit in front of the radio and look at the radio, I remember asking my mother clearest day riding in the backseat of the car. Are those people inside of the radio? She said, no, they're probably at the radio station. I said, then we have to get down there because I remember saying that in the backseat of the car, just being enamored. And then one day I was there. Yeah, you really were. And then you've done so much more, you know, with it since. And I love the community element as well. The fact that you were, you are still in touch with so many of the women that you came up with. And I think that, do you believe that, you know, your network is your net worth and that sometimes it's not about looking up, but looking sideways as well? That is absolutely truth. That is so well spoken. Indeed, I agree. We really forged a sisterhood and it wasn't just about being friends with someone because they had the same position as you at another label. No, we've shared trials and triumphs and we could close our doors and call one another, someone else at another label and say, girl, you will never believe what happened. Okay. I need you to talk me off the ledge. I need you to help me not kill someone. I need you to help me give me the words that I can say the next time I open this door and someone would help you. And our sisters would help you. And we would support one another, go to each other's events and provide each other with concert tickets. And just it was just a camaraderie. And we were just genuinely happy for one another to see our sisters climbing. And for those who were backbiting and tried to still work and all and didn't want to see people rise, you know what? Those ladies are no longer working in this industry. Those ladies did not last long in the industry. So we dispel the notion that women can't work together. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And I think that's def that's a myth. Um, that's 100% a, a myth because some of the yes. best work that I've done has been with other women. And on the artist side, I think one of my um, final questions, there's going to be a lot of artists that are watching this as well. We've had 50 years of hip hop and there's so much that you can learn, you know, from each decade. And we're at this point in hip hop where it could go anywhere. I mean, the, the, it, it's, it's, it's at this massive commercial place, but there's also so much room for growth within it still as well. So what would you like to see for the next 50 years of hip hop where women are concerned? I would like to see women be written back into the story. However, we don't have to beg anyone to do it, that we can do it for us, ourselves. And I would like for more women to step up and tell their stories. Each of the women who have written a story in this book have their own stories to tell. And this story in Women Behind the White Mic, their mic checks that are in the story, in the book, it is just an entree to their own work. And we are encouraging all of the women that we know who work behind the scenes to write their own full book. That's what we want to encourage them to do. I would love that. Just be able to go on, you know, the Apple store, the Amazon store and be like, right, women that work in the music industry, which book am I going to read today? Because I thought yes. that, that would change so many things um, for me and my and my way of thinking. So I think that would be absolutely amazing. I would I would love that. Um, yes. There's one video that you're putting out because it's not just a book. Like you said, it's a community you've written a curriculum. Um, you're doing talks, you're doing tours. Um, but there's also a YouTube uh, visual side of things that's coming as well. And one of the ladies um, that's behind Women in Hip Hop, the podcast, she said, uh, create, don't wait. That's and right. That, yeah. So <laughs> create, don't wait. And the idea is that stop, don't wait for somebody to to put you on um, right. to start creating and to, and to start. And I guess I can mean on, on any size, on any scale as well. Right. That's right. On any level. We don't have time. We don't have time to sit around and hope and dream. You can do things by yourself. When you have a device such as these fancy phones that we have in our hands, you can shoot your own movie. So I am going to be armed when I get to London with my own uh, phone and stand up. Uh, I, I don't even know what you call all of the stuff. Selfie that's, stick. <laughs> selfie stick. Thank you, Jams. <laughs> selfie stick and tripod to film because we're going to be dropping all of these things into the documentaries. 
Brilliant. Yes, and we are going to have our own docu series, and we can start by putting it just on YouTube. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and we don't need anyone's permission and anyone else's money. That's brilliant. I mean, that's inspiring in itself. So you are doing so much great work, the Joyce Brookshire. Thank you so much for all of your wisdom and all of your advice, and of course for this, the Bible basically, the, no, we don't use the word Bible, <laughs> for this, the musical Bible that we can use to forge a path Volume forward. one. And volume, volume two, the hip hop edition will be out in November. Boop, boop, ready. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Jams. Thank you.